So all I'm going to say is thank you to uh, Claudia and Ben for whatever it is they're actually going to do in the next um, 85 minutes or thereabouts, because I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I shall leave you to it and David will facilitate to the extent that's possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. It may be possible. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. How did you want to just kick off? Yeah, I could actually. So um, let me share my screen and do it right. I have to click the right buttons. Should work, hopefully. Oh. Wait. Let me let me do something. One moment, please. Set it up properly. So while I'm um, fuddling around with the technology here, I, I could actually uh, talk, start talking. Um, I was trying to do this here so it I can actually read my notes, um, which is always a little bit. Uh, now it should do that. And hopefully you see now, yeah. you should now be able to see my, my my slides. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, super. Okay, so what, what we are doing is um, speaking about conversational modes of engagement in art and design education. And probably I have to turn off these floating panels. I'll do that. Um, if you have any notes or any comments, you're welcome to use the chat, but I'm not going to be able to see it. So um, please just feel free to speak up in that case. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm in introducing some examples from art and design education, and then Ben will take over. And he said he would be doing a little bit more of a theoretical part and but but just take off from my examples basically and and we will have then time for a kind of breakout session um if we're not so many maybe um we can just turn it into a conversation among us so conversational modes of engagement in art and design education In the 1943 short story, Mimsy, Where the Borough Goes, written by Catherine Lucille Moore and Henry Cutner under the pseudonym of Louis Paget, a box with children toys originating from a future time and place is sent to earth. A young boy finds the box and carries it home. While he gains enough of an understanding of the toys to play with them, to his parents they remain obscure. It is the boy's baby sister, still unconditioned by language, who from her understanding of a different order shows the boy how the toys can form an exit, assisting both children to escape the world of prediction toward the future. The short story Mimsy Where the Borogos was included by the cybernetician Gotthard Günther in the first German language collection of American science fiction published in 1952. Language matters. The story argues and influences the way we understand both time and space and ourselves within. Maybe it was the memory of the mirror appearing as a fluid image in one of the books 
that I once read, which led me to this forgotten place. The unity of one single person was depicted in the mirror as a symphony composed of present and past, and thus as well of future personae, a symphony of life which would never repeat itself, and in which every chord would appear as a possibility for the myriad pluralities accruing from it. An almost impossible thought in this millennium in which humanity is about to achieve its objective of tracking everything that is uncertain. Paradoxically, it was this unknown image of the plurality of reflections that revealed the path to this place, which is not drawn on any map. We could call it maybe the path to cybernetics. Seeing comes before words, the child looks and recognizes before it can speak, said John Berger in Ways of Seeing. When we grew from children into adults, we learned to name what is around us and words have become what we rely on. It is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Said again, John Berger in Ways of Seeing. And I think I would like to expand it into sensing. It is sensing which establishes our place in the surrounding world and the relation between what we sense and what we know is never settled. So when we speak about design education, then what we try to reinitiate is a kind of a sensing of space, of things we don't have words for. We knew how to experience space before we knew how to speak. We have forgotten what we knew before to experience the world as if we did not know any words to name what we see, touch, smell, and hear. So as architects and designers, we need to recover that spatial experience, what that spatial experience is. And to do, do so, we need to learn again to sense And this is where I think the, um, conversational modes come in because they're fundamentally important when initiating this resensing, re experiencing of things for which we have no word. And with this learning once achieved, perhaps one could argue language could, should change to reflect the newly learned mode of conversation, seeking what is aesthetically potent as Gordon Pask has pointed out. And this is an early installation from 1999. And my first reflections on this relationship between design, and art and, and language and how we can speak about these experiences. Perhaps someday the Blue Room will travel the world temporarily occupying urban space, subsequently leaving that space behind again 
but with a rem remembrance of something blue connected to all the other blue spaces the room will have left behind. Within everyday experience, conversation is the most basic experience of intersubjectivity. All aesthetic experiences open a space towards intersubjectivity. They carry notions of the rituals of the past before they were institutionalized and they were, when they still serve the building of community. For one day, the blue room juxtaposes the church behind it, taking possession of the plaza, just as the sound of a church bell creates a sphere of influence within the city space. Inside, it is entirely blue daylight entering only between the ceiling and the walls. Four speakers transmit the sound of the sine wave, which by means of super position extinguishes itself in regular sequences. Behind the window, a girl enjoys a perfect view by looking through the clear circles that she has drawn into the transparent moisture aspirated onto the glass's surface. Myth is close to the sacred source of language and gesture, she whispers. I live. Thus, I am consistent. So um, there were a number of experiments that, that explored the spaces between language and design and art and how we can express one in, in, in the medium of the other. Before I, I, I went to China to take on position at the very young, architecture faculty, uh, it was just founded a year before. And um, really founding a program and thinking about this, thinking about how to, how to set up an architecture program in a context where, where it, it, it's, it's well known that the students that come to the university have gone through an uh, through a, an education in school that did not foster um, independent critical thinking and one could easily see this in the context of of um, the the UK education system, where when I, I was in 2011, I was at a review at the Bartlett, and there were numerous Chinese students in the master program, and they were clearly very clever, but they didn't perform at all. And I was wondering at the time what the reasons could be for for this, and to which extent one could set up. A, whether it's possible to set up a program that um, that works against these uh, these weaknesses, which are certainly not kind of ingrained in the students, but in in uh, came where the result of a very particular mode of education. And I think my response at this time was <laughs> to. Um, to and maybe also a way, maybe also a form of desperation, one could say, but at the same time, you know, it's been a very successful exercise, or I call it a head for three at a picnic. And 
instead of starting the architecture a course with um, with with kind of a drawing of a house it was clear something else had to happen we have to kind of unsettle the students and then to some extent all design programs need to do that but um, so in this case it it was it's really a conversational exercise and this is the the, the short text that we that i handed out to the students that um, explained then that we should conceive of architecture as as, as something that moderates um, between people and their 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 desires and necessities and then they were given the task to create a device that would moderate this picnic situation um, our rent a picnic in our first exercise we will design an object that is not yet architecture however could be called an architectural device for this, we are given a situation and also a set of inhabitants. Our situation is the picnic. And then because I'm teaching at Liverpool's campus in China, so, so we have here also a kind of cultural introduction into the British picnic with lots of rain, I guess. Um, so throughout the centuries picnics have been quite fashionable and they still are yet as british literature shows us fashionable and agreeable are not necessarily related and so on so um given a little bit of an introduction how um, how picnics can go wrong and uh, i don't have the monty python monty python image here which i showed the students but um that was is a very bloody one anyway so they have um these these roles also because i think at the beginning of a design education it's very important that they they don't they don't have to when they just meet each other they don't really have to talk so much about themselves but can play roles much easier um so they get these different groups um a poet and a is her stiff aunt, uncle, and uncle, and a board neighbor, and so so people that who cannot really do a picnic together, and then they have to do this device, and they have certain materials, and yeah, we did this exercise for many years, and this is how it looks like. And um, this way here, this video. So it says second year because the Chinese students have um, they have the first year in which they have to do math and physics and all the things that are required for the Chinese degree. And, and they enter the architecture program a year later. So that's why it said level, uh, second year, but it's level ones are going around. And then they, they do these devices moderating between these different persona characters that they were given for the picnic. This is an early, this is from 2016, there were some earlier ones. It's like this. Also it's a very short exercise, like one week. And this, uh, the old building, this is 2012, I think. And then they continue and develop this into um, spaces, um, draw, draw the space that they had built first and, and then explore it and kind of build a negative of it, which then becomes a house. So here we have some more images from this is later 2019. 
Yeah, and then they, they do it at the picnic, explore these spaces, project them, scale them, explore them again. And yeah, that's the exercise. Um, last, the last example that I want to show is, um, takes us outside of the university into landscape. This is in the very uh, remote countryside of Fujian province, um, where a colleague of mine has initiated an art and design festival um, which is an experiment at the same time in rural revitalization. And uh, yeah, really an experiment. It's now running for the third year. At the time, these images are from its second year, 2019. We set it up just before the pandemic, no November 2019. And that was the second year for that festival. So the situation in this, uh, in this place is that they have these beautiful mountain villages that are quite important also from a heritage point of view. Um, but they, they young, all the young people leave because there are basically no jobs because and, uh, farming is, is hard work in these circumstances, because you can hardly use machinery. I mean, we see here some flat um, areas, but there are not too many and the rice, rice farming can hardly be industrialized. So um, this is what, what we did. Um, it's, we call it seeds for seeing and um, it's, um, in a, in a very small village with like, I think there are still like 30 people left, mostly elderly. But the, the, um, the point was to, to place something in the context of this festival that, that, can, be, that can be utilized. That is not, not just art that, to, to uh, look at, to contemplate, but something they um, can experience and somehow interact with. And so we have these turning seats and they are meant to, they can, they can be turned and the villagers can make this, convert, create these conversational groups. And we will see that um, it's quite interesting how different uh, groups of people use this work quite differently. It's, I did not do this alone. There was a team. And most importantly, my colleague Yi Ping Dong, who initiated, co initiated this festival. And um, yeah, so they are seats, but they are not really seats. <laughs> they are they're, they're circles. They don't really feel like seats because they're like in the, in the way they they act when you sit down is, is like a little bit surprising, but then at the same time, they're, I mean, they're, they're there to initiate play um, or also a playful attitude towards you know, uh, maybe also initiate more kind of exploration. And for the kids, it's obviously a lot easier or they, they naturally do it. Um, but one can see that the elder population then <laughs> kind of in, in a way, either they follow the children or they, they just do it naturally as well. So it's, it's really a, a work for everyone. So this is the village we have seen in the background, some important buildings, important from a heritage point of view because they wouldn't, old wooden structures that um, are, are need to be preserved. And these are the, the kind of objects that we, we, we see around the sides, a lot of roundish objects, circles, and a lot of um, work that uh, 
works with strings, a kind of weaving a lot of, um, yes, these, these kind of objects that is the local handicraft basically. And so we were inspired by this when we selected the forms and the materials. And the work can also be dismantled again, but it's still up there um, because the villagers did not want it to be taken down after the festival. The festival was uh, originally running for, for uh, three months, but um, we would need to go and repair it. But so far we, we weren't able because of the travel restrictions here in China. But the, the frame, all these things are still up there. So it's actually quite durable. You can see how they, the workers, we had uh, uh, someone from the university workshop, um, a carpenter from our workshop with us on site for a day on instructions. But then after that, um, the, um, the workers in the village did it themselves. You can see how that works. It's a little bit unusual from an architectural point of view because it's just, it, it basically has these steel rods and then you just put it on. And that's also how you could dismantle it again. It's almost done, the seats. When we arrived, and then we spent one day in the storage seats. It's almost done. And that's the day of the opening. Uh, there's still some, not everything finished, but um, yeah, and then this was the night of the opening when the children discovered it. They don't normally live in the village, but they come back for important events. And that is also one of the reasons this festival exists, because it attracts the young people back into the, into the region. And we can see, so to, to come back to the theme of the session, um, conversational notes needs also is, is about learning to collaborate and to pay attention to what the others do. Um, as one can see here with the children. Um, if they organize themselves well, then they can all turn their seat. <laughs> oh. Oh. Or they get stuck. Um, yeah. And the same is true for adults. With this, I'm I'm actually at the end, and I would hand over to Ben. Okay, perfect. Share my screen. Okay, um, so I'm going to pick up and go in a slightly different um, direction from there, but it's going to be really helpful to bear in mind those examples if you're. Um, as the kind of world I'm talking about. I'm also experimenting with having the most boring slides I can have. So it's gonna be quite a different kind of presentation at this point. Um, and the thing I'm gonna try and kind of pick out is something particular that happens in these kinds of contexts, which I think is really valuable and, and you, can you can sort of build from it, which is where conversation can be both process and content. And I'm going to talk that through from a, um, in quite a pedagogical way, I think, which, uh, uh, and, and referring to my own practice, and then maybe kind of speculate a bit on what other things you can do with that. Okay. Um, so one way of thinking about um, cybernetics is as a, through a, you can think about it through a series of examples of feedback processes. And I imagine, um, you know, probably you, you know, by this day of the event, you've probably kind of meant, used this quite a lot. You've probably mentioned things like a thermostat and a ship, steering a ship and things like this. And these are all examples of, um, yeah, feedback processes. Feedback for me, I understand it as um, 
kind of process where the observed outcome of action is an input for further action. And you can think about that in many contexts. Um, and yeah, the sort of obvious examples, the firm start, the ship and so on, but conversation is another one of these. And it's quite different. It has much more going on than those examples. Um, it's quite rich. Um, it's a bit more complicated. Um, but it's also one that we have a kind of everyday experience of. And this is part of the kind of value of it. Um, we experience it in professional contexts, in everyday contexts. You can get a sense of how it works from the inside. We're talking about something quite familiar and embodied. And we all have a sense of what makes a conversation a good conversation, a bad conversation, an exciting conversation, a confusing conversation, a generative conversation, a boring one, and so on, and what isn't a conversation. Um, and this is the sort of things you can kind of bring to bear on, on sort of the cybernetic discussion, if you like. Um, conversation has a deep resonance with both design and with education. And this means that you can, it can be an understanding of both the process and the content. So as a design educator, the processes of teaching and learning are conversational and the content that's being taught and learned how to design and how to, how to design things that are engaged with is kind of all about conversation as well. Um, design's often been likened to conversation and it involves conversation literally. So like as a designer, you spend a lot of your time talking to people, um, trying to listen to them, trying to understand their um, uh, needs and desires, their views. Um, and it's also, you can think of it as being kind of less literally as a kind of method, which I'll talk through a bit. And also the pedagogy is often built around, um, uh, you know, um, small group conversations. Um, so what I'm going to talk through is, um, yeah, this idea of a kind of parallel between the process and the content, opportunities in that for explaining, for critiquing, and for practicing design education. And then at the end, some of the possibilities and limitations of the kind of fairly circuitous and internalized way I'm going to frame this. Um, and, and what that could mean for cybernetics in its encounters with other domains. And hopefully that will make some sense at the end. Um, okay. So conversation as a cybernetic process, and you may be familiar with this, you may not be. Um, so first of all, literal conversations, um, but more than this, I think we mean more than this. So, um, uh, we're describing a kind of feedback structure that goes beyond um, just the setting of um, having a conversation with someone. That's like the paradigm example, but then we can talk about other things that have this quality. And this is um, a comparison to dialogue. You know, we can use those interchangeably, but dialogue very literally means through the words, right? It's very much in that verbal language setting. I think conversation is more of a... Um, it, has a slightly different resonance which I think is helpful and literally it means turning about with so con with Vasare to turn around and this gives you a sense of the process which I think is important to remember I'll try and speak to that as we go along um, it also has an ethical and political sense like it it kind of meant to live with to live to, to hang around with people right to turn around with them to live with them and I think this is important as well. Okay. Um, in cybernetics, conversation arises in the context of teaching and learning and work of Gordon Pask and colleagues. And it's, yeah, thinking about how to structure. So it's a very educational kind of perspective initially. It's about learning, it's about how to structure courses. And it's based on the premise that you cannot simply um, transfer understanding. So it's kind of against or sets itself against a kind of information transmittable model of education where you have a lecturer and they explain something and you receive it. And instead it recognizes that we're gonna be constructing separate understandings um, and we're gonna coordinate to agree those understandings. So we have a kind of social process where we um, 
construct separate ways of understanding the world and we coordinate them so we well, even though they're separate we can act as if they're the same and rather than seeing that difference that separation between different kinds of un, you know my understanding your understanding rather than seeing that as a difficulty to be overcome um, it's seeing these differences as valuable uh, and essential to learning so differences are maintained by and they're required for the conversation and um, if the difference becomes neglected, uh, the conversation becomes difficult. And this is really difficult, different to um, uh, communication. Maybe I just explain the mechanism in brief first. So the basic idea would be that if we're trying to agree something, then I might, um, you know, uh, make an effort to explain it to you. Like I'd say, conversations like this, and then you. I, I can't pass that directly to you. You build your own understanding of what I've said. Uh, maybe you say, do you mean it's like this? You, you give that back to me. I have to build my own understanding of, of what you understand. And that gives me two things. I have my own understanding and I have my understanding of your understanding of my understanding. And they're both my understandings. I haven't had to get something from outside. I can compare those and I can see to the extent that we're on the same page. Um, so that's a kind of, and you're doing the same. This is a, um, a mechanism where the differences are maintained, but you're also coordinating. And you can compare this to um, communication and you can contrast them. So you need some kind of communication channel for this to work, but they're quite different paradigms for thinking. So um, if you think of what is successful communication, then successful communication would be where the listener's understanding starts to match the speaker's, right? So you're reducing the listener's understanding to the speaker's understanding, trying to get them to um, match as much as possible. This is inevitably kind of redu reductive, right? If you're trying to, or conservative, we're trying to conserve the existing meaning. Conversation's quite different. There's no attempt to do that. This is about coordinating things that are different. Um, so it's very different kind of politics, very different kind of pedagogy in thinking in these two ways. Okay, um, so design as a conversational process. Um, the, the key point in design to get across quickly is that you don't have the criteria in advance. Um, so uh, when you're being a designer, um, this, you're dealing with situations where it's not clear what you should do. Um, and that's why you have to design something. If it's clear what you have to do, you're not being a designer in that moment. Um, the criteria uh, for success are created and changed by trying to do things. So one tries to act and by acting, you learn new criteria emerge. And this is why you can't analyze the situation in full in advance. You have to act in order to generate the criteria and the whole process is a kind of muddling through of um, creating the criteria you're meeting. So you have to act even though you don't know how to act. And this is a kind of example of that, that way I characterize feedback at the beginning. And it's easy to kind of flip in, if you, you think of design from the outside, it's easy to think of it maybe more like kind of steering or goal seeking. Um, this isn't really the sense of feedback that's important in design that kind of optimizing or targeting feedback, this conversational feedback is the important thing, which is where the essentially the thing you're trying to achieve is changed by trying to achieve it. This is the richer conversational sense. Um, so what you do is you start by doing something, even though you don't know what to do, you then learn from how what you have done doesn't work and you do something else. This, um, uh, this produces um, the uh, changing criteria, right? This produces learning in what you're trying to do. Um, and you can think of that as a kind of turning around. So conversare, to turn around, to, take, to move from one mode to another. And that's the competency you're trying to um, create in design education. So in design education, I work in an architecture school. I'm not actually, you know, you're not training someone to be product directly productive in 
current skills in our potential practice you do you do that on the way but the the core lifelong skill you're building is how you kind of approach any kind of situation um through this kind of thinking how you, how you um uh respond to situations where there isn't yet a, a, a clear way of responding correctly. Um, and this can have some different forms. So it can be very quick. It could be uh, very literally a verbal conversation. So you could do this in a conversation in a team or with a client or with someone, another stakeholder. It could be through drawing and sketching. It could be slow. It could be iterations of whole projects that take years. Right. You know, you design a project and then you kind of realize that actually it's quite a bad idea. So you kind of take that learning into redesigning it. And it could be participative practices that involve quite a large number of people, but that just have overall this this kind of structure. And all of these forms are kinds of what's common is a kind of turning around between doing something which could be speaking, could be drawing and understanding what's being done. So that's listening, looking. And we often associate the first of those with the creative part. Um, you know, so I'm speaking right now, or when I'm drawing, I might be doing a drawing. And I, you often think of that as being your creative, productive part. But often when I'm speaking, you know, I've, I've said this sentence before, this is not you, right, um, for me. Um, when I'm drawing, I've usually got a plan of what the line's gonna do when I start from one end to go to another. It's actually the creative part is, um, from a cybernetic analysis of it is actually the listening and the looking. So the other, um, the, the way you um, have to create some new understanding or you have the opportunity to look at something you've done in a different perspective. And um, my supervisor, uh, one way he phrased this was, um, you know, designers make mistakes that create opportunities, which is a nice way of thinking about it. You do something you kind of, then look for the opportunities in what you've done. And this needs a particular context. Um, usually this is a studio, um, uh, like the kind of spaces that, um, you know, the, the hat project, right? So if the hat goes wrong, actually that's not a, such a big problem. So there's, there's things that um, uh, we do as a designer, which are not conversational, you know, so for instance, um, building procurement, um, construction information production where actually you want to minimize the conversational elements because you are not looking you don't want anything to change you want it to be built built like you intend and so on um, but in order to produce that information you have to create spaces where um, uh, which have a different kind of character okay um so that was sort of that was design as a conversational process now to just flip to design teaching and learning design pedagogy so design pedagogy is often revolved around very literal conversations kind of one-to-one um, -one often or small groups um, it doesn't successfully or rarely does it successfully move into a lecture sort of standard lecture format um, it's very much a 19th century model of a kind of apprenticeship um, that's what its origins are. It didn't really do the various changes that happened in the 20th century to education. And for that reason, it has a particularly interesting character and often it's an interesting paradigm um, for different modes of teaching and learning. Um, and it's very open to very decentered forms of teaching and learning, um, which are not really about the teacher. And when I, any of you that are in education would have heard in you know, one of the things that fairly recently is a kind of trend is the idea of the flipped classroom where the student becomes the center um, rather than the teacher well this has already had kind of happened like you know for a couple of hundred years in design right it's kind of about the student being the center um, they do the preparation um, by working on their projects they present the lecture because they tell you what their project is as the teacher you're actually in the mode of trying to learn what the student thinks and it's very much the opposite way around in a very kind of um, full-on kind of way and I'll explain a bit more about that as I go on um, but not all conversations are conversational so one of the difficult things in um, 
design education is that you can think you're being conversational because you're literally having a conversation, but it's very easy to slip into a communication mode, even though you might be in a conversational setting. Um, so you can easily become the kind of expert as the teacher. And students will often want you to be that because they're used to that and they want to be told what to do. Um, a colleague of mine, you know, when she would be asked uh, by students, well, just can you tell me what you want me to do? Um, she would say, well, what I'd really like you to do is, um, you know, mow my lawn, but it's not really going to help your project. And, um, you know, that stopped that. Um, and this can lead to a bit of frustration. So one of the things that I find interesting that comes up a lot is um, students would um, complain or worry that their tutor keeps changing their mind. So um, one week they'll say, well, maybe do this. Another week they'll say, oh, no, I'm not sure about that, do this. Um, and on the other hand, tutors might say, um, oh, that student's really stubborn. They won't take advice, you know, I won't, won't do this. I keep telling them to do this. And in both cases, this comes from the way that the kind of educational mode is um, quite implicit and actually not a lot of people understand how I think it works anyway, um, what the underlying mechanism is, is the conversational mechanism. Um, so for instance, the, if your tutor keeps changing their mind, this is great news, right? It's destabilizing, but it means that um, you're actually making progress because it means new criteria are emerging and you're learning. If your tutor's not changing their mind, your project's probably not getting better. And it's kind of very rare to kind of say that explicitly um, in architecture school, but I think it's kind of interesting too. And I think similar for the, um, you know, the other way around, the, uh, you know, maybe um, if your student's not taking your advice, maybe you need to give them different advice, right? Um, and I think there's a, um, the, uh, if you start thinking, and, and, and this becomes frustrating because we start thinking of a conversation simply as assistance, whereas actually there's something else going on. And that's what I'll come to next. So thinking of design, teaching and learning from a cybernetic perspective, I think unveils a kind of reveals a kind of another set of possibilities. And I speak to kind of my own kind of thinking on this, my own sort of journey as a teacher. Um, there's a potential to align the process and the content of teaching and learning. So what you're actually trying to, you're trying to teach through a conversational mode of engagement and you're trying to teach students to conduct conversational modes of engagement, right? So kind of you have a form content um, match. And this means you can, you can model what is being learned in the mode of learning model what's being taught and learned in the, in, the, in the mode of teaching and learning. And I think this is particularly important in the first two years, first couple of years of education, architectural education. Um, the, the conversational setting is often a tutor leading a conversation through a process, through a design process, like really thinking aloud, you can think of it like, you know, what would happen if you did this? Have you thought about X? Have you thought about Y? What would a structural engineer say? What would the person opposite say? What if you did this? Have you seen this project? Blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes that's like direct help, right? So, you know, please look, go and look at this. It'll help you do this. And sometimes it's actually making things more difficult. So sometimes you're like, well, have you thought about this? Um, and what's happening there is um, relates to what Gordon Pask called um, in the context of art, aesthetic potency, um, which for him was a effective learning environment. And part of how he designed um, some of the learning devices like the keyboard instructor and, and, and the um, different learning environments he designed. Um, and this is to moderate the variety of the situation so that there's, an, there's enough novelty or surprise value or difference going on that there's always something to learn about. It's never under, totally under control, but there's never so much going on that it's um, that, that lacks unity, that it becomes overwhelming. And he designed things like the keyboard instructor to always be 
be moderating its difficulty to be challenging without being so challenging you can't do it. And that's what you try and do, what I try and do as a design teacher. Um, you're trying to moderate the difficulty of the task so that the student's always learning. Um, and like a downside of this I found in my own practice is that this means for a, a student, things never get easier however well they do, right? So you keep doing stuff, you never finish, and you keep just raising the bar because you just have to keep learning until the end. So I have a lot of students who would become very surprised they got A's, right? Because they didn't have that experience. I haven't figured quite figured that one out yet. Um, now, as the student continues through their education, they um, these things that are happening verbally, like explicitly or externally in conversations with others, with tutors and, and with their peers, um, you learn to do those yourselves. You can internalize them. You no longer need to talk about like where the best place to put a door would be or um, maybe what to do when you get stuck in a certain way or where to look for a precedent, a precedent of a particular kind of um, uh, building and so on. Um, you can in, you learn to do that process that was previously the teaching teaching and learning process. You internalize that and you begin teaching yourself internally. And this frees up or makes a foundation that freezes up a space to have different conversations. And that, that's, and that I think is how design education works. Um, but it's quite hard to say that because showing and telling are different. I think this relates to the kind of um, ways of sensing, right? So you need to show this, you can't tell it. Um, telling it is a bit like, um, you know, trying to learn how to play cricket by reading the rules, right? Like I know how the LBW rule works, but this is not necessarily gonna help me um, uh, become a good cricket player. And I think there's something else in design education. You can't really explain design in advance. You have to learn to do it um, without knowing how to do it because that's what the projects are like. The projects are where you have to act without knowing what the criteria are. But what you can do um, as a teacher is you can point out things that have already been learned. And this I think is, um, really important and a bit neglected. Um, and I think of this a bit like the meta conversation in PASC. So a conversation, one can have a conversation and then you can have a conversation about that conversation to clarify what's going on. You might say something like, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> am I being, uh, um, am I being clear? These are conversations about a conversation. They have the same structure. One can have conversations about those. Um, and by moving between like a conversation which is modeling a design process with a student and a conversation about that conversation you're having, you can make explicit things that are learned, things that have already been done. So the student will do something, you can draw attention to it by having a conversation about that. And that's a way that um, it's moving between the implicit and the explicit. And that's, um, well, that's the sort of guideline that I've used um, in my teaching and learning. And I just want to um, maybe just open out from that a little bit, um, since it's just in kind of in closing, um, to kind of what's going on there more generally as a kind of idea about, about cybernetics. Um, so cybernetics has this idea of analogy, I think, really deeply rooted in it as a um, method you know you can go back to um you know macy or um bateson or all kinds of um different thinkers and there are different kinds of uses of analogy and metaphor um so you know this is the idea in the animal and the machine or ashby all possible machines um and I think sometimes these are kind of uncritical, we could say uncritical. So we start to think of, you know, machines as if they are biology, or we think of um, biology as if it is a machine and treat one as if it's the other. And this sort of, we can kind of recognize the disciplines that kind of fell out of that, like artificial intelligence or certain forms of cognitive science, which are quite uh, mechanistic in their approaches. But you can also think of those analogies as being crit critical um, 
moves. So one can start to, to build analogies between different domains using a structure like conversation. One can apply a um, kind of thinking from one to the other without saying they're the same. Um, so for instance, one can start to critique technology from a, from a use a biological perspective to critique technology. One can use a technological perspective to um, uh, um, critique a idea about cognitive science, say. Um, and then in the kind of practical domain, um, you know, we, rather than simply using um, cybernetic explanations as theories, so I can use this as a kind of theory of um, how design works and how research works and so on. Um, you can also use them as pedagogies. So by internalizing an understanding of one process in terms of some other process I've done, um, and that more generally is a kind of practice or a method, a way of doing something, um, of recognizing, using the parallels between things to critique or learn. And this is a little bit different from what I find the usual discourse is, which is a kind of theory explanation, which is always looking for an application. So, so rather than using analogies just to theorize and to explain things, um, and then one gets to the question of how do you move from that into action, I think it's interesting and uh, maybe something to take forward to think of how those analogies can be in themselves actions. Um, there we go. So that's what I wanted to share. Um, and then we have a little, um, uh, a few questions prepared for you. I don't know if we want to just have a moment for any general questions. Would that be an okay thing? I think if anyone, I didn't, I have stopped looking at the chat, but I'm not seeing anything. We're, we're too far away so the people who are not at the university can probably chat with more facility than those of us who are sitting around this. Sure. Um, David, maybe you could just, if there's any, we have a little breakout now, but it's maybe if anyone just has like a question in the room, it might, might be a nice time to take them. There's loads of questions one could follow through, maybe to sort of avert being questions um, oneself. And this is reminiscent of uh, various strands, like we have been beyond experiences. In groups. I'm wondering how you evaluate your outcomes, as students evaluate the outcomes, how other parties evaluate outcomes, and what levels of fine tuning or finer tuning, if that's the right phrase, or gross intervention, you know, may evolve uh, from any such process. Is that a question? Yeah, I think so. When you say outcomes, do you mean like as in learning well, outcomes? Uh, well, I mean, wonderful um, structures like the um, uh, uh, the, the uh, seats for seeing and, and so on, uh, presumably is a reflection of something which you, Claudia, and others have gone through yourselves. I mean, are you seeing, let's say, more creative, functional um, outputs from the products of your students as they continue through uh, their career? Or, I mean, there's implicit knowledge, and I think I, I, I'm expecting a good dream tonight from uh, watching all this because there is stuff going in which I can't really articulate terribly well. Uh, at the moment, so I'm trying to push you into doing uh, that for me, but uh, <laughs> we could go on to the uh, questions for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer this. So the, uh, I think um, the, the, for the seats of seeing, we just not, I mean, we, we worked with like two alumni on that project, but it's basically not really a student project, but in this case, the, the, the what is of interest is really um, the way the, the, the community acts or reacts and the feedback we have received from, from the village and the people and, and the people at the festival, but also the fact that they, they wanted to keep the work. 
and um, yeah, I think there's that 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 is already, or maybe <laughs> Reynolds would say, good enough in a way. Um, <laughs> um, so we were actually quite happy about this. So there, there is a kind of um, the, 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 the village has sort of adopted the work, and that 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 is actually quite good. Uh, I think one cannot wish for more. It's, it's already, I mean, it's um, quite good. And and that that everyone who comes to the village, um, you know, the, the children enjoy it, and and the the elderly use it to to do their I don't know lunch chat and stuff like that. So it's it's weird enough to be a little bit. It's a little bit like it's, it's a little bit weird, and then and 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 that that is good because it works as an attractor, but is uh, it, at the same time it's not it's not too weird to be totally off you know it's, it's something they can they can still use as a seed for example or like play with and and so it, it's inviting play um and then and then in regards to outcomes for the students i think in my case it's relatively easy relatively easy to answer even uh, it, it sounds a bit boring but our students they 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 have chosen Xi'an Tong Liverpool University because they want to do a master's overseas. And um, in this case, we can relatively easily me uh, measure uh, how successful our program is by seeing how many how, how many of our students get accepted at really good schools and how then they perform. So I think we, we, we were doing very well within a very short time. So our first cohort had um, students accepted at the top uh, program in the UK and um, they go to Harvard, Yale, wherever they want to go. But that's really a little bit also, they, they, sorry, they look, um, they, they apply to the, to the universities that rank top. And, um, but we have had good feedback also from from these master programs from colleagues teaching there that our students were well prepared. So obviously it had, has nothing, you know, everyone can perform in design and one can very quickly also catch up. Yeah, and the fact that they haven't had this kind of very um, a school education that didn't necessarily encourage them to independently and critically investigate and do all kinds of things besides school. Um, that that didn't that is not necessarily a hindering I them. For that. I don't want my question to sort of preempt. Uh, there's somebody uh, else online. Given I. We've got to stop facilitation. Just unmute yourself and ask the question, and then there's a number of people in the room who will have something to uh, say uh, before um, you come back to question us. Uh, yeah. So it was uh, wrote, wrote a question. I don't know whether you care to read it out, Catherine, or whoever asked the question uh, wants to uh, deliver it. Can we see it? Uh -huh. Right. Uh, should we? Should we? Re so this is. Uh, is this about the, the question in the chat? You are asking uh, Maria. Maria. Maria's question. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. 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 Thanks. One second. Okay. Thank you, Ben and Claudia. So Maria's asked a question, and the question is, uh, she also expresses her thanks, and it's, I wonder if you consider that in pedagogic context, doing and understanding can be connected in infinite loops, helping to establish the conversation through a trial and error process, or is it more of a linear situation? Please refer to the chat box if you want to read through that again. Yeah, I think Ben, uh, you can. Ah, sure. That's um, yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think it's a kind of interesting thing to think about the tensions between 
what's or you know when is when is design conversational when is it not um so th there's certain kind of pressures that are you know or, or approaches that are very much about production um some schools kind of emphasize that or about the finished product um and there's other ways of thinking that are more about um the quality of the process and i i think it's very much um what you're trying to do in an educational context is is um support people's development of how they design and this is slightly different question to how good are the outputs of that design and it's very easy to slip into simply comparing um the qualities of projects but the and that's a kind of index of how well designed they are but the point is not you know if it was just about like how good your product project is you would just trace like you know a look at Boussier building or maybe someone else's building actually but um you would kind of just you wouldn't need to design it you just do something that's really good um so there's something about um uh yeah taking that kind of conversational process kind of serious thing but then it kind of still often needs to be communicated you need to bring it to an end it isn't just about saying it staying at the same kind of register throughout a project you have to move through different stages and part of i think learning to be good at this is learning when to move on or when to draw a conversation to a close again you can think of that in parallel to just conversations you've been in you know some of them we kind of know when a conversation goes on too long right or when it gets repetitive or um, when it gets a bit boring right you need, need to kind of think about what you do to keep it moving forward um so i think that's maybe my response to response to that there's some kind of judgment over when to kind of stop and that is um uh in a sense it kind of gives it a direction do you want to add anything claudia would you like to add um yeah i mean the the question is maybe a little bit about this infinite and that is also what ben now uh, kind of um refer to so to which extent is it infinite um i mean from a from an from a philosophy of art point of view i mean we could easily uh, discuss this that there there is this a sense of something making a unity when you you know it, it, you kind of reach that point where you know you you stop and so it's not really infinite even though it's i mean john dewey would, would say you know it's, it's like it makes it makes a unity without um stopping yeah so it, it, it aesthetic experience in this context yeah which we could also link to past again is this experience of something coming together of a kind of closure without uh, uh, putting a stop but yeah so um, so it's not really infinite in the sense of a linearity That's right good. so thank you you can see the next question coming up at what point you decide to sort of put uh, our questions on hold and uh, give us your questions and hope the time okay. Uh, before three o'clock, it's probably best down yes. to uh, your judgment, Claudia and, 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 and Ben. So, uh, can I ask a question? Okay, Great. Go, go ahead and you can decide when to answer it. Great. Ben and Claudia, I was just going to say, I just put in the chat, um, you both are in demand. We have two more questions from the room. So we, of course, appreciate you guys are experts of the subjects. But if you could just give us a glimpse into what could otherwise be an extended answer, that'd be really nice. So my question to you is from a student perspective, uh, not a design student, but I am a business student. But I've got a bit more of an abstract question for you, which is, um, you as designers, um, do you place greater emphasis on how the individual components function on their own or the harmony with which all of the components function so is that what is of more importance 
design. Uh, the holistic perspective, as in the sum of the components, how they perform, or indeed the precision and the individual quality of each component that constitutes uh, a particular product or a particular project. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I give you yeah. the opportunity to answer. Yeah, the I mean, I think it depends what kind of designer you are. Uh, not what sort of thing you're designing, but um, in what your what the context of the project is. So, you know, for instance, if um, you know, there's some context where it's very much about the the whole, because it, I think if you're in a context like service design, you know, this is about the sets of relationships that exist, right? Um, but in a more kind of artifactual context like architecture or fashion, um, you can tell, you know, you could approach take designing a building or a piece of clothing as designing that artifact, or you could think of ways in which that design, designing that artifact um, intervenes in larger systems. So it, what relationships is it in and how does it redesign those? So, um, and I think these are different kind of orientations. So, you know, one approach to like the circular economy to reduce waste in construction is to reduce waste in your building. Another approach is to redesign the building industry. And these are both kind of could be done in ways that are essentially through the same, on the face of it, the same project. Um, and so I think both of those are always going to be synthetic, but these are synthetic of what's within versus what's without. Um, so I, I hope that's an okay answer. That's what comes to mind. It's an interesting question and it's an interesting answer. Thanks, Ben. Is there something you'd like to add, Claudia? Yeah, I, I was thinking, I think um, the typical kind of design task would ask you to, um, the, the expectation would be that you, you, one attempts to integrate the, 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 the in individual components with, with a whole. Um, I think that, and to some extent there will be always compromise, but once things start kind of, you know, conversing with each other, then there's also a whole. So, I wouldn't necessarily separate um, the thinking of the component from the thinking of the whole. And I think in, in kind of organizations, uh, I mean, you can translate this to uh, social organizations, I think companies uh, as well, you know, the, the, it would be, I think, the, attempt to integrate. Great, and I guess because you, of course, start with the individual component, or rather, this is a question to you, uh, just to follow up that, when you're designing, you, of course, think of the individual components themselves, right? So that comes before the holistic composition of the design. Is that true? Could, could be both. Um, oh. Yeah, there could be different approaches. Yeah. And often when even shifts, from thinking the very, very small and then thinking the very, very large and shifting back. Yeah, this is uh, so the, any thing participates in more than one whole, right? So this mm. is, um, you know, you can define the boundary in different ways. So you can think of your question through, um, I, I don't know if you come across boundary critique, boundary judgment, but it's, um, in critical systems thinking, which is you know known in the co context of business and management, so it could be a good reference. Um, but if you think of like a, something like a refrigerator, um, you can think of a refrigerator as like in the context of your home or your day, but you can also think of it as a way to redesign cities. So cities are different because of refrigerators. And if we didn't have refrigerators, then this would completely change the relationship between urban and rural um, situations and food networks and transport and so on. 
um, that where different things are, where you have to walk in the day. So you can think of anything as actually having massive ramifications in the hop in the whole, right? Depending what boundary you want to draw. Um, so I think the, the the kind of systems approach to this is to realize what comes from the framing you give and that you could have given a different one. That's great. Indeed, we yeah. frame everything, right? So that's cool. Thank you both. And we have one more question. Would you like to ask it? That's okay. I'm happy to move to the questions the guys who got them on the line. So oh. thank you anyway. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, if I had to call on. Um, in no that problem. case, uh, okay. we, we have a question in the chat or we don't? No, that was me, I think. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I'll set this little. Yeah, we have this question, some question for you. We can do this as, um, we can do this a bit longer, but we've um, had some nice discussion here, so we can do this quite quick. Um, so we do it as maybe five minute conversation rather than 30 minute conversation. And um, are you, could I just, could someone tell me how many people are in the room? One, two, three, four, five at the moment. And so then you can see how many five. are in, a, in their own rooms uh, yourself. Perfect. So I think if um if in the room you could split into two groups, so a two and a three, and you just got a couple of questions to just add, just talk through in your group. Um, so first, in what ways are your own practices in professional or everyday context conversational? And in what ways are these different to the sorts of conversations we've discussed in? in art design and education and because we don't have much time you might just focus on one of you who maybe share your own context and have an ex example um, and then kind of yeah just to kind of let you kind of think through that a little bit more um, and maybe we take five minutes to do that and then each of the two groups in the room and um, the online participants if they'd like to participate in this um, maybe just share for one minute what you discussed that sound okay. Um, sounds good. Will you call us back when you uh, want our feedback, or shall we try and do that ourselves? Or it's we gonna, can, we, yeah. We can scream. We can say, "Time's up." <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> we'll start, and somebody will stop. <laughs> yes. you call, I um, think what you said. She will let us know when time is up if we don't uh, do so ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so, so, so if you are online, uh, if you want to, if you want to participate, then uh, you can, what you can do, because we are not many here, we can, uh, you could just uh, unmute yourself and engage in a discussion and maybe, um, I could set up a breakout room, but I think it's not needed, Ben, huh? We are, I think the advantage of the breakout room might be that they don't get the sound from the microphone. Okay, yeah, that's true. Let me try that. Yeah. So maybe do that, and then if you, um, you know, you, I know it's very early in the morning for Howard, so I don't know if... Um, oh, you know what? The, the uh, Zoom was not set up to open these breakout rooms. So we can't do that. Because it's a setting, I forgot. But, um, yeah, the function is not activated. So, which means, so anyway, maybe, um, I don't know whether Tom and Howard want to discuss, then you have to do it like this. With the background noise, because I cannot open the bre uh, breakout room. Uh, it, it is not noisy. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that, you know, I was thinking about a, a conversation that I had yesterday and uh, where we're designing a, a game and the kinds of different assumptions that that people brought, brought into the process and the the challenges of uh, uh, this type of consensual coordination uh, in, involved in a, in a seemingly simple conversation. Was it like a, a, a board game or a, a something like a, a physical? Um, it's it's a 
world a world building game. Uh, so there there is a world building game that exists with with certain parameters and. We're trying to develop another version of of this game specifically for currencies. Um, <laughs> anyway, that was that's a quick example based on your prompts. Um, it certainly wasn't about information transmission. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, <laughs> attempts at coordination. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a, a game also has to challenge. It needs to be fun, you know. It can't be boring. <laughs> that's number one, I think. <laughs> can't make a game that's boring. That wouldn't be a game. Yes. Yeah, you know, actually, part of our conversation was about what is the purpose of this game because the previous, the previous games were were about waste uh, reduction or uh, uh, about. Um, uh, it's kind of goals that are that are more easily identified, and so why we would want a game about currencies was was a uh, a focus of conversation for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be the most obvious uh, kind of theme. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, just a, a personal anecdote there. But thanks for your for your talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the these kind of design situations occur all the time in everyday life. You know, it's not they are not they are not really um, they are not just. I mean, it's not something that just occurs in design education. It's really facing them all the time. Mm. We're designing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, often we don't, you know, we don't we just do it intuitively. Tom, would you like to share anything? Um, yeah, I, 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 I guess the, I, I work in infrastructure, so I'm just looking at systems and their interdependencies and coming up with you know, logical arguments as to why net zero matters and why resilience matters and why different types of changes to the system can enhance those or or, or the opposite. Um, so I, I guess a lot of the way in which I'm trying to communicate these things is conversational because you're trying to engage others in concepts that you think are important, but they some you're talking to the preaching to the crowd, others you're trying to change mindsets. So yeah, I, I, I guess I hadn't thought of it, but a lot of what I do is trying to be conversational. I guess the most compelling arguments probably are conversational, uh, kind of build on some accepted things to then twist it around and, 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 and illustrate what I'm trying to drive at, maybe. Um, so yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever learn about, like, do you ever change your own mind when you're trying to change someone else's? Yeah, frequently, um, and the the discussion kind of picks up holes in my own own thinking as well. Um, so, yeah, I think I've oversimplified something for communication purposes. And then somebody challenged me precisely on one of the bits I, I knew I'd oversimplified. Um, so it, it was kind of yeah, it illustrated what had been lost. I'm trying to be conversational rather than trying to be rigorous. So yeah, all, all the time I would say. Um, and it's, but it also strengthens my opinions as well if the conversations reinforce it. So I don't know whether it's conversation group think or whether it's um, genuinely useful. I don't, I, I don't know, but it's, it's been thought provoking. So yeah. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. We, I think, as we're coming up to towards the end, so I don't know if we yeah, have we have to say time's, time's up. Screen, yeah. <laughs> time's up. Maybe we can have the room, uh, the room back. I don't know how we do this. David, <laughs> we call the room. David, 
Yeah, so we just got a we just got a couple of minutes left. So it'd be great if maybe just each group shared one thing they mentioned, maybe just 30 seconds each, keep it quite oh. short. And maybe um <laughs> I don't know, Howard or Tom, maybe one of you would share one of the things you said. Either way. Would you like women to start then? I mean the Yeah, why not? Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Cool. So I can go very okay. Um, so we had a group of three ladies, and uh, we tried asking the first question. Um, refer to our own practices and conversational. Uh, so somebody spoke about their professional experience and how they had um, a Zoom call with loads of international people, so from the East, from Europe, and from the Americas as well. And we were just talking about how, even though we they all spoke English and communicated English. Uh, just the cultural differences, even though they were subtle, they made all the difference. So, for instance, American people are direct way of speaking, whereas apparently the British speaking metaphors, which is tough for the rest of uh, the international community on the call to translate. And um, how, yeah, just the sort of cultural variances, how they always kind of created a barrier in the conversational element, but still, um, that's something which had happened. But that's pretty much us. Great, thank you. Right. And then the other, the other group, the outside group. So, so we're talking so we're going to talk about me basically. So, 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 so um, what I do is kind of process technology behavioural change um, um, around improving outcomes in terms of quality of the outcome processes. So a lot of that is talking to different stakeholder groups, and it's very iterative both in terms of the conversational aspect, in, ter in terms of what is the best holistic design, but also sometimes we do stuff in phases. So there's that empirical thing of going live with version one and then getting further feedback and then refining the design for version two. I mean, I, I, I would add, it's, it's, it, it is a bit like art, where you have an artist creating something physical and one is good at say molding it, another one is good at the painting, and you have to communicate with the other artists to try and trace it. So you have different yeah. departments in your company, yeah. and so his language, and color it in a way that that other guy will know. Yes. We're doing all yeah. different things, but we're creating one, well, it is yeah. art. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, so that, that's the parallel I found from what he was saying. And actually, we all talk about the same thing. Yeah, so exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. Precisely, yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. Um, and then Howard or Tom, would one of you like to share something? Okay. <laughs> Howard, if you want to go, I'm happy. Uh, okay. Um, let me see. I think what what stays with me is this type uh, type of uh, conversation and trying to coordinate around finding the purpose, the, re the real purpose of the activity. And, and so we were, I was yesterday involved with a, a group of people and, and working on a project and there were different understandings in the room about what it was we were trying to do. So uh, when we got down to that conversation is when it got really good. <laughs> uh -huh. Fantastic. Howard, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. I think we're about at time. So, Tom, you um, want to? Maybe? Yeah, Tom, unless there's anything well, you want to add. No, no, I just, just echo that. <laughs> okay. Getting mm. shared awareness to conversation piece. It's so well. And uh, yeah, <laughs> lots of things are still to process. So, uh, I think you can always express our appreciation with the way we have it.